Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Things are gonna get heavy today because I finally have a return of a Gibson 7-string guitar. Long time ago on my channel, you can see it over here, I did have one of these 7-string Vs, but <laughs> something happened with the Steinberger tuner and I just never liked that guitar and I've been scared of Steinberger tuners ever since. But luckily, I have a little bit more experience with them yet today, so I thought I'd give it another try because believe it or not, there is not a single actual demo of one of these things on the entirety of YouTube. There's just my video and then one of Essex Recording Studios basically just doing a condition rundown. So today, we're finally going Going to get to talk about a seven string flying v <gasps> but wait is that <laughs> yep that's right guys i'll tell you the story of how i ended up getting gemmo i did not get it from the mod collection but first we need to start learning about these weird seven string flying v's all right, so late 2000s, early 2010s, Gibson was doing a whole bunch of weird stuff. These seven string flying Vs were introduced first in 2011 through 2012 as a small limited edition run. How many of them were actually made? We don't really know. There was a video that said 200, but going through the internet archives, I could find no official number posted by Gibson. However, I can say you rarely ever see these things, so 200 might even be too many, <laughs> who knows? But Epiphone also did these seven string flying Vs in the late 90s and early 2000s if you're looking for something a little bit less expensive. Because the original MSRP for these were $2,129. That doesn't sound too bad today about 10 years in the used market because these are kind of collector's items at this point. But if you don't like flying Vs, there's also 7-string Les Pauls they played around with, 7-string Explorers, 7-string SGs. If you're not a genty guy, you can go wangly twangly with the 12-string Les Paul or the 12-string SG. Or if you like to get... <laughs> Without having additional strings, you can check out the Les Paul Studio Baritones, there's Baritone SGs, the King of Baritones, the Buckethead series, there's even Baritone Explorers out there. So Gibson was really trying hard to break into that market and they just never really succeeded. I mean, there's other brands that do it better. The biggest critique with these guys is the fact that they're not very Gibson-like. None of the seven string offerings were done up in baritone or any type of extended scale length. They were very expensive for one of these genty guitars. And most of them had very unbalanced looking headstocks. Like, I mean, look at the Les Paul one here. Four strings on one side, three on the other. They look a bit goofy. But that's where the seven string flying V comes in and why it's one of my favorites. It's not an unbalanced headstock. They basically just put a third eye on it right here. So it still looks, you know, fairly traditional. It's not as out there as some of these other ones. And Gentmo here has just taken this the whole thing to a whole new extreme. So originally this guitar would have looked like this. So we originally had gold hardware all over this thing and more 57 style appointments. It came stock with EMG active pickups, the 707 in the neck and the EMG 81 seven string in the bridge. It had a black pick guard on it with Steinberger tuners, a plastic truss rod cover and the whole three knobs and the toggle switch and a circle output jack. So those things were pretty well specced out, right? But Gemmo here is just a completely <laughs> different thing. So first off, one of my favorite modifications that the mod collection did on this is they tried to make it look a little bit more traditional with six regular style tuners, which are locking rovers, by the way, and only one of the gearless Steinberger tuners. So you only have six sticking off the side of the headstock, so it looks normal in that aspect, but you just have that one up there like that. And then for our truss ride cover, it looks like they put one of the high performance flying V ones on there. It's a nice little touch, makes the guitar extra metal. But since those EMG pickups are so big, they actually had to make a custom pick guard in Perloid for this one to cover that all over. Now Gemmo here, it looks like you can actually remove that. That is just on that little plate. So I was correct in that assumption. So we'll see how it looks on and off, but you're gonna notice this is a one pickup machine. Now we're gonna have the route in here. Like if you somebody wanted to customize this to be a dual seven string one again, you could. But look at this, master volume with these tiny little knobs and master tone. So it's no longer a three setup right here. And we've got a bucket head kill switch on here. Love it. And then they modified our tailpiece with this trapezoidal one. I don't know. Does that have anything to do with gent? I'm not sure. Pretty much the only modification I don't like on this is the, the four screw output jack on the front. I would have rather had the circle one because that's what makes flying Vs in 57 style cool. What else is interesting about this is since this used to be active, you have this right here. It's a real big missed opportunity for them not to have routed that out a little bit more for one of those Stein 
Steinberger leg rests like you find on the V90 series and the V90 doubles. Or I suppose it wouldn't be that hard to route it out to have one of those rubber bumper strips like the 50s flying V's had. So, now you guys probably wonder, how did I get Gemmo? It was actually a fan of the show. He was the one that got through the cart glitch and got it. But when he got this guitar, he saw everybody in the comment section going, oh man, I wish Trogli could have got Gemmo to document that thing. So he offered it to me, but... We almost had to cancel this sale because he said, ah, oh, something's not right with the electronics in here. It's, it's like scratchy or something's not working. So I told him, Gibson has a two year warranty on these things for playability. That should be covered by that. And that is a transferable warranty. Now I'm hoping on the workbench, we can just fiddle around with this and it'll be okay. Like if it has something to do with the kill switch, that's beyond my scope. But if it just has to do with something fell loose, I should be able to fix that. So his name is Pacifica Guitars on Instagram. I think he also sells on Reverb. So if you want to show him some love for selling this guitar to me so we could all appreciate it, you can check out his IG link in the description. So yeah, first impressions of Gemmo. It actually looks better in person, I would say. I mean, it's pretty much what I was expecting. My first Flying V7 string weirdly had an ebony fretboard, which is not spec. I suppose it's also possible that it wasn't actually ebony or just like a really, really dark rosewood and I didn't know enough back then. But even looking back at that video, I swear that I was ebony. It looked pretty dark. But now that I have more experience with, you know, different kinds of guitars, this seven string, I mean, it's got a really big wide neck. Essentially what the measurements are going to be like is the 12th fret at a normal guitar is essentially how big it is here at the nut. I mean, you have an extra low B string here. So you got bead G, B, E. So we can get extra low on this guy today, but that is a super thin feeling neck. I mean, it's not as weird as the first time I had one of these. And I'm really happy that despite Genty guys probably liking active electronics for the most part, this has been swapped back to passive. So that means all of our electronics in here have been gutted as far as the original ones go as well. In Gibson's description of this online, it said it came with a soft case, but it showed a photo of a hard case. So I was kind of unsure what this thing was actually going to come in. And lo and behold, it actually came in a hard case. I was surprised because that box felt suspiciously light. So that's a very happy surprise. As far as other case candy, I mean, you get your warranty evaluation. That's all basic stuff. You can check out my other reviews and demos if you need to learn more about that. But it looks like we've got a strap. We have a COA for the mod collection. That is strangely upside down <laughs> let's help them out a little bit in that aspect and it looks like we have a gibson multi-tool and like polishing cloth and all the other good stuff that you normally get on a gibson which is interesting because i don't think that was out when these things were out so i think they stole this case from a different guitar so to learn more about Gemmo, let's throw it on the workbench, attempt to fix it up, and then we will get to a playing demo of a seven string gibson flying v Inside Gemmo! Unfortunately, I am really, 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 really disappointed when I took this off. Do you see what they were going to do? They were originally going to put a flanger in it, and they didn't! Gibson Demo Shop Mod Collection, guys. Why didn't you put the flanger here? <laughs> that would have been really cool to have a built-in flanger of this thing, because if you remember correctly, that other cool flying V that only had the neck pickup, they had put a piezo system in it and used this giant route in here to put all that stuff in there. But yeah, that's what that looks like it says to me. Flanger GG here. But anyways, here's what the inside of one of these things look like. You have space for a seven string pickup. So if somebody were to buy this, they could put a neck pickup in here if they wanted to. They would just have to cut the pick guard a little bit. It's still there. You can see our long neck tenon. And then in our other pickup cavity, it's pretty much just more of the same. You can see the original DS, V, maybe T, and then they had some more blue marker in here that they put in for whatever reason. But it's interesting. It looks like they had to do some additional routing in this area to make sure that the height adjustment screws would actually fit. And you can also see they had to put some wooden dowels in here to make sure that you could actually screw those into here. Because I think the other ones were mounted to the pick guard, so they probably had to do that just because, you know, this is an aftermarket fitting job here. But as far as the pickup in here, it's the SH4. As far as pickup readings go, I'm reading about 19k ohms. I'm not sure if that's right or what, but that's what it says on my meter. My first impressions of these little knobs, didn't like them cosmetically. How do I feel about them as actually using them? 
don't really like them. I mean, they have a nice gripping system on it, so it's easy to quickly move them, but I'm just used to larger speed knobs, and that you really can't do. They're slow to move like that. So this is something you would have to take the time to take two fingers to do instead of this. That would take some getting used to doing. Then, of course, the kill switch just temporarily kills your signal. Buckethead's known for using those, so we can do a lot of fun things with that. As well as, you know, kind of genty ish stuff, because they're known for, you know, don't stop and. I'm curious if you can do that with the kill switch. <laughs> so, when the Pacifica guitar guy sold this to me, he said, uh, something's shorting out here. I'm not quite sure what. I was fully expecting, you know, something got knocked loose in transit or something, but what it ended up being is this is a four conductor pickup, so it has four wires. Two of them, the black and red, needed to be taped off so they could utilize the green and grounding and the white one. But despite them doing it correctly and taping it off with actual real electrical tape, somehow through all the plastic casing and the tape job that they did, it was still shorting out on something. So I just taped it back a little bit further, and then I jiggled some things just to make sure it was working, and then it stopped working again. Every time I would put the pick guard down, it's like, oh, come on. What is wrong with this thing? Is there something truly bad that I'm gonna have to solder? So I'm over here, like, messing around with the output jack. Did they solder these on backwards or something? Because I was getting no signal when I first plugged this thing in. And I wanted to make sure that it was gonna continue to work. So I lift it up, yes, yeah, starts working again, nope. It's silly me, it's, it's, it's the kill switch. <laughs> so yeah, we had some wires shorting the circuit and then the kill switch was playing a joke on me but they just have two gibson branded pots in here all the soldering work is actually looking really good on this so that was just a small little boo-boo there but it looks like they had to do some additional routing in here in order to make room for all this stuff so it just goes to show you that these guys are not scared to take a drill bit and zoop in fact it's actually interesting that they routed this out because now we can see the mahogany body, which this is a solid mahogany body. Now you might be wondering what this hole is for. That was over here. So this is where you would normally put your nine volt battery back when this had active pickups in here. And when I first got this, these wires were in here. So I was thinking, ah, oh, did they somehow do it? So that's why I wrapped them around here. So I'll try to find a way to make sure that those don't interfere with anything. But there you can see that is a super deep channel route. So I suppose you could fill that in and then route this out for one of those plastic bumpers to make it look kind of cool or just leave it as is or, you know, stash whatever you want in here. Just put a plastic plate over here and you got a smuggler seven string V. Here's what your output jack looks like. Everything's good there. They use the square style one, but here's what's really interesting. It doesn't appear this guitar was ever finished at the factory because generally these would have had the circular ones, but we don't have the holes in here for that. Kind of a similar thing with this trapezoid base right here. You don't have any extra holes, but I think that would line up with the normal one anyways. And I was surprised. I looked on Reverb. You actually can buy seven string versions of the proper triangular shaped one. So that is an option for somebody if they wanted to continue to modify this. And then being a seven string bridge, obviously Gibson doesn't make that. So they have this bad boy on here. It's the BH-997. I'm not sure who made that, but it looks kind of like a import style stuff here. As far as big metric studs, you can adjust it using a flathead screwdriver. What's kind of interesting about this pickguard is the fact that the bridge is so big, it has to be cut into it. So you don't even technically need any screws if you want to be crazy because that will hold it in place. But here's what it looks like without the Gemmo on it. I can see why they put it there because that's such a big area that they had to fill. You can definitely tell that was a custom guard because it wasn't perfectly cut and smooth along the edges right there. But Gemmo was pretty much just painted on the back of like a clear piece of plastic and then they secured it with two longer screws. So you can take it off, you can leave it on. I don't know, I'm starting to grow more towards it on this way, but I think for today's demo, I'll leave it on. Moving on from our body, we have a mahogany neck with a rosewood fretboard. Despite being seven strings, it still only has 22 frets. That's something that somebody might not like about this one. It doesn't have a full two octave scales, but but we do not have any inlays on these and it's just a straight up rosewood fretboard. But now it's time for real fun. Measurements on a seven string. We have 1.96 inches at the nut, 2.33 by the 12th. So that's like a third of an inch bigger at that area. 
but yeah, it's still going to be a pretty slim neck. So 0.82 at your first fret neck depth and 0.9 by the 12th. So <laughs> it's a very skinny neck. It kind of makes it feel like a D-shaped neck just because of how wide it is. Think that typical 61 SG style neck, but then make it even wider. That's exactly what this feels like. Great if you're trying to do like a flat thumb on the back of the neck. Although I think it would have been absolutely hilarious if they put big 50s chunky necks on these. <laughs> I really hope they do that one day because that would be a massive neck. Here's what that neck profile looks like on the contour gauge. Yeah, that's really wide. Now the Mott Collection spec sheet said this is an asymmetrical neck. I mean, it kind of feels slightly D-shaped because of how wide it is, but it's more so C-shaped. But uh, it does look like it has a little bit of asymmetricalness to it. But I did not see that in any of the official Gibson marketing when it originally came out. Now moving on to our headstock here, I was already telling you earlier how they put one of those high performance laser engraved etched Gibson truss rod covers on it. But what's funny is it looks like this was part of an error batch where they started to do it on the back too, but then someone's like, uh oh, we weren't supposed to do that. And no, that's not just that Gibson showing through on the back because it's in a completely different way. The stock ones were black. Those were pretty cool, but I think the metal one looks nice on this as well. So we've got six of the regular locking ones, and let's talk these gearless Steinberger tuners. I had to look up a guide. Thankfully, those exist now. Back when I first had that seven string flying V, you guys gotta remember, you couldn't actually buy these tuners separately yet. You could only take them off of other guitars or buy them on eBay or Reverb used, and they would sell for between $300 to $450 a set. That's why I was so scared to do anything to that thing. Nowadays, you can buy these things brand new. I think they're like $130 a set, so you don't have to worry too much. So they're kind of like a PRS tuner. You use this thing right here to lock your string in place. So if you were de-stringing it, you just do that. I mean, if it feels like it's stuck, just keep trying and it'll eventually unlock. Then you put the string through and just like any other locking tuner, you just lock it down in place like so. And then on the back, as you tighten this down, that starts to move down. And what that's doing is it's pushing the string down and that raises the pitch. These are 40 to one ratio locking tuners. One of the best tuners that you can actually buy today. They're a bit finicky to get used to at first, but after the learning phase, I've heard a lot of people love those things. And now that they're not so expensive to replace if something does go wrong, they're a much more viable option if you wanna try something a little bit different. Now we've got it all put back together, I thought it'd be apropos to take dimensions here because the flying V shape, I mean, it's naturally kind of big. So if you make it just a little bit larger, you're not really going to notice it. Now, unfortunately, I don't have regular flying V specs on me today, but it looks like it's about 16 and a half inches at the wingspan, about four and a half at the shoulders there. And I'd say about 18 inches long from where the slope ends. Scale length wise, we're still at 24 and three quarter inches though. Man, can you imagine Gibson doing baritone seven strings? That would be cool. Looking at the edges, nothing too fancy here. We've already talked about that area. And your strap button is down here. And at the base of the heel, it's the large strap button style. But what makes this different from a regular Flying V back here is the string through ferrules are like bass style. So they're extra ultra heavy duty because most people using these seven strings will use heavier gauges. So these are actually proud on the back. They stick up a little bit. And here you go. You can really see just how big that neck is here on the workbench. That's a very wide feeling neck. So this one was made in 2011. Looks like a little bit more than halfway through the year, but you can also find these until about 2012. So we've got regular Grover's locking on here, and then we have the Steinberger. So my last thing I wanna talk about here is, technically, when they put these Grover's on here, they put worse tuners, because 40 to one ratio is insane. The Grover's aren't as good as that, but they look a little bit more traditional. The only other thing I can say that these have over that is the fact that you can use a string winder on them to quickly string them up, but they're locking tuners, so it doesn't take too much. But as far as super quick string changes, these definitely are a little bit easier. And up here we can see our tiny little mod stamp showing this is part of the mod collection. Blacklight test just for fun? Yeah. 
mean, the finish doesn't do too much glowing, but that pickup is just blindingly fluorescing. <laughs> that would look great on stage, especially with that kill switch kind of popping out too. With not too much to report back here. Our last spec to capture here is the weight. It's actually really light, seven pounds, 2.1 ounces. Even the hard shell case is surprisingly light. That's why I thought it would have had the gig bag like it was advertised as. Well, let's go ahead, plug Gemmo in and hear how it sounds. All right, this thing just keeps giving me problems. Now it's wired where the tone doesn't work. <laughs> Just like it's stuck on zero to three. I th this is not the demo shop's best work. Let, let's just say that <laughs> we can still have fun with it. But I'm gonna see if I can fix it. All right, here I am. Here's how I have to demo this thing. Don't ask me why. This only works if the pick guard is slightly being bent. So I've got some tape to slightly bend it so I can play. I'm gonna have to send this back to Gibson. They're, they're, they're gonna fix that <laughs> because I, I don't understand. My best guess is the tone pot is bad and somehow that slight bend just makes whatever is short circuiting in there work. So let's go ahead and get our demo like this.
Now that we know all about Jumbo, what are my final thoughts on this thing? Man, this guitar is a big pain in the butt just to get the thing to work. It, it shouldn't be this hard. It has to be a broken pot or something. I cannot explain why bending the pick guard ever so slightly makes it work because I don't see any wires that move with that. So it has to be some sort of an internal component. As far as the seven string flying V goes, I don't really know what I'm doing with the seven string, but I found if you kind of tune it as like a drop D, but with your B going down a step, you can kind of get away with just doing your chuggy chugginess like this, and then do your regular power chords for the normal stuff. And that just gives you like instant gent tone if that's what you're going for. Unfortunately, we didn't get to play around too much with the kill switch because it, it just messes with everything. I'm pretty decent with the kill switch too, because all the bucket heads I've had, but having it flex, it, I just couldn't get the timing right. So even though this one was kind of a bust, I'm gonna let you guys in on a secret. I've got another seven string that's not a flying V. It's from one of the other popular Gibson ones, so we'll have to give that one a try. All right, Chocolateites, uh, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.